you're from a people who took and took and took and took, and from a people taken. You're both and neither. That's how author Tommy Orange sums up the paradox of being Native American and white and the complexity of that identity in the US today. His novel, There, There, has had praise from author Margaret Atwood, the Pulitzer Committee, and is a New York Times bestseller. Tommy joins us in the studio to tell us more. Hi, thanks for coming on the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Well, I'd like to start by talking about the title of your book. There, There suggests that it's about place, but place ends up being quite a complicated idea in this novel. Can you tell us why? So it's about people from Oakland, um, California, in the US, and um, Native people, if they're from the city, the from is tricky here because um, a lot of Native people relocated in the 50s and 60s from reservations. And as you know, reservations were something that were set up and people were from somewhere else before that. So people in the book are, are struggling with identity and what it means to be from a place and feel like you belong somewhere. And this is a Gertrude Stein quote, and she's talking about how her childhood home was no longer recognizable because it was developed over. So Native people are trying to understand in the book what it means to belong in Oakland and to a country that was taken over and taken from um, those people and what the original land may have looked like is no longer recognizable. And these people are struggling with their identity and what it means to belong. And so the there there is like sort of a super location. Um, and then also kind of a, the irony of it not being a comforting book either. Yeah, like there, there is the sort of the. Yeah, it's not so reassuring, is it? Now, in your book, you mentioned that some of the stereotypes that surround Native Americans, pop culture depictions from the Lone Ranger to the Last of the Mohicans, and often these are images of people living in the Wild West, in rural areas, in harmony with nature. But as we see in your novel, there's actually an urban experience that's very different. Can you explain? Yeah, I think for the past decade at least, um, seventy percent of Native people have lived in cities. And for, for the longest time, we've been only depicting um, Native people as being historical. Um, and you, in order to be an authentic Native person, you look this one way, and it's always sort of this, you can see it in your head as soon as I ask you to think of a Native American, probably with a headdress, probably sad looking, and probably historical. And so um, I, I very much wanted to write a book that felt like right now and felt contemporary to resist this idea that we only exist in the past. Um, because you know, there's a lot of people living now who are native and know the, their roots, and there a lot of those people are living in cities, and and there's a different story to tell that hasn't really been told very often. Mm, and indeed, staying with this uh, relationship with a place, land, and the exploitation of natural resources is at the heart of an ongoing struggle between indigenous peoples in Brazil and the country's current administration. President Jair Bolsonaro has said that native Brazilians have access to too much land in the Amazon and that he'd cut funding to initiatives which protect those communities. Claire Rush and Sophie Samai have this report. In traditional dress, indigenous peoples sing as they gather in the Brazilian capital. Every year, thousands of natives come to Brasilia to call on the government to protect their rights. It's never been more clear that if we don't keep our heads held high, they'll trample on our rights. This year's so-called free land protest has taken on a new significance. Since taking office in January, President Jair Bolsonaro has rolled back tribal protections. He transferred the regulation of indigenous reserves to the agriculture ministry where a powerful farm lobby has long opposed tribal land rights. The far-right president also placed the indigenous agency under the new Ministry of Family, Women and Human Rights, led by an evangelical pastor. The Justice Ministry used to oversee all indigenous affairs. Now, its responsibilities have been split up between various ministries. This weakens tribal rights overall. In Parliament, opposition lawmakers and indigenous representatives have sounded the alarm. Bolsonaro's government has launched more attacks against indigenous peoples than any other government since Brazil's transition to democracy. It's a serious threat, a turning point. Brazilian activists aren't the only ones calling attention to indigenous rights in the Amazon. Artists around the world have also been standing in solidarity. Leonardo DiCaprio has supported the Wairani tribe in the Amazon in their fight against oil drilling. 
Meanwhile, dozens of celebrities, from fashion designer Vivian Westwood to singer Julian Lennon, have backed a campaign by Survival International to protect the Awa tribe from illegal logging and ranching in the Amazon, a rainforest essential to the survival of hundreds of indigenous peoples. So as we saw in that report, in Brazil, people are protesting against forest clearances and the uh, implementation of a power line across uh, indigenous land. And then elsewhere in the world, we're seeing that this climate emergency is becoming a priority for a lot of people. Do you think that indigenous people are involved enough in that movement? Um, I think where we can be, we are. I mean, we saw in Standing Rock, um, this is um, something that I think brought attention a lot of attention to Native authors post Standing Rock. We saw um, Native people standing up just for clean water, and um, and we saw what happened once Trump got in. So um, there's different national park areas that are being opened up for land grabs through the Trump administration, and Native people are protesting where, where we can. We're a smaller number of the population and don't always have um, the ability to to not work and feed families and go off and protest. Sometimes that's a privilege and not necessarily uh, something that we can do. Now, coming back to the book, one of the characters in There There, Dean Oxendine, is involved in documenting the Native American experience through videos. And in a way, it's a mirror of what you're doing, which is bringing a rare Native uh, voice to the arts and culture mainstream. And this year, Yalitza Aparicio was the first Indigenous woman to be nominated for an Oscar for her role in the film Roma. How do you feel about that? Do you think the arts are really opening up to more diverse actors? Yeah, I think it's um, it's something that's been happening over the past several years. Um, but I think with the political climate um, has forced people to maybe um, pay even more attention. And I think people are not wanting to be on the side of, of what the, this administration in, in the U.S. represents. Um, so I think you're seeing people pay more attention to diverse voices and to highlight diverse voices in a way that I hope is sustainable and not just sort of a trend. Um, I hope it can continue in this way. Because there's always the danger of tokenism, I think. It is. Sometimes, you know, if, if you're saying this is the indigenous voice, it, it's really minimizing. And, and um, I think sometimes we don't get the same freedoms as, as um, let's say, white a white artist might be able to do whatever they want. And, and um, people from oppressed... Um, cultures and uh, communities sometimes bear the burden of having to represent, you know, in a way that it's not always put on on um, privileged artists. Mm -hmm. Now, indeed, that film, Roma, was notable for the use of mixed tech, the language that the character Cleo speaks, an indigenous language which predates the arrival of the Spanish in Mexico. Mixed tech is an example of the sort of cultural heritage that UNESCO is looking to protect and promote in this year's International Year of Indigenous Languages. The initiative seeking to raise awareness around the 7,000 indigenous languages spoken worldwide, of which some 2,500 are in danger. Well, UNESCO's Assistant Director General told us more. Uh, the culture is endangered. People, they live, they can live in, the, in their environment, in the rural environment, they can live in, in the urban environment. But what is important is just to protect this, uh, their culture, their history, their traditions and their languages. Of course, uh, when it comes to education, which is uh, a very, very important uh, role in, for the, for in UNESCO, with native languages has been very, uh, and educating in native languages is uh, one of the major programs that we advocate for. Well, language can be a vehicle, an important vehicle for indigenous culture in many ways. What about yourself? How important has it been for you? Were you encouraged to learn or speak your native language? So my dad um, is a fluent speaker of Cheyenne and um, he, it was his first language. He didn't speak English until he was five and got into school. And, um, but when he raised us, um, he did not teach us the language. And we, we grew up hearing the language. He would speak it in phrases and words, um, but we didn't learn it in a formal way. My sister just became fluent, and uh, me and my sister and dad are actually trying to translate my book um, as a way just to have it on um, as a archived piece, um, but also to help me learn. Um, so I'm now trying to make efforts. It's so important. There's so much value embedded in language and um, aspects of a culture are in language in ways that you can't, um, you can't know otherwise. 
And it would be beautiful to see the book in that language as well. Now, I presume the most common case for people in the US and in Mexico as well is, is being bilingual, having both uh, languages. And some of those people might identify as biracial or bicultural as well. How easy do you think it is today in the US to assume a so-called mixed identity? I think more people feel a mixed quality than don't. You know, we just had a biracial president and that's, you know, um, that's not nothing. And I think a lot more people have the experience, he, even who aren't necessarily biracial. I think it's something that people intuit and understand. Um, and I think even more so moving forward, we have to really advance our, our language around these complexities of, of the way cultures mix and what to do, what to keep and what to, um, how to adapt. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, we asked you to give us a cultural tip, something that we should go and see, hear or um, read. And you pointed us in the direction of an exhibition on at the Smithsonian in Washington right now. It's called Americans, and it looks at how American Indian culture has shaped uh, the country's identity. What was it that really struck you about that collection? Well, it pairs really well with the prologue to my novel and the the curator for the museum gave me a personal tour of it. Um, something that struck me that there's a, an entry from an Oxford English dictionary that shows that um, native people were originally called Americans before Americans were called Americans. <laughs> and this is part of what, why it's called Americans as an exhibit, um, because we, you know, Native Americans was an added addendum later. Originally they would call native people the Americans. Different aspects of, of history that we think we know, and it sort of digs into that next uh, layer. Okay, well, it sounds fascinating. Tom Orange, thank you so much for coming in thank today. Thank you for having me. We'll, le we'll leave you with some of the highlights of that exhibition in Washington. And do remember, you can get more arts and culture on our website, and you can keep up with Encore on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this.